Well, good morning. Again, my name is Andrew, if we haven't met. Uh, I'm excited to be here as we continue this series, walking through the book of Acts, as we look at how the Holy Spirit was moving throughout the book of Acts. And today we're going to come to Acts chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, But first, just want to set us up uh, based off of where Phil left off last week. Last week, if you weren't here, Phil talked about this guy named Saul who was on this path. He was set to destroy the church. That was the one mission he had for himself. And so uh, he was going on this trip to go and kill or arrest some Christians. And on that trip, Jesus interrupted that trip and completely changed his life. And God poured out his spirit upon Saul, and he actually gave him a mission. He was going to be what was called the apostle to the Gentiles. Which sounds great, right? Giving him this mission, but there's one major problem. Phil noted that this was a turning point in the book of Acts, but the problem is, is that this comes five to 10 years after Pentecost, after Acts chapter two happened, this moment where the church was born and God gave him this mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So that had been given five to 10 years before, and yet we have this moment where there are no Gentiles who have been invited into the people of God. They haven't been going out and evangelizing. They haven't been targeting this group uh, up until this point. So something has to happen to change the trajectory of the church. And today we see that happen as the Holy Spirit worked through one of Jesus's first followers. Now, as we come to this point, what we see is that Peter reappears on the scene. And Peter uh, is a follower of Jesus. That was one of Jesus' 12 original uh, disciples. And Peter uh, reappears on the scene at the end of chapter 9. We see him heal this lady named Tabitha. We see a bunch of people respond to the gospel. And we see in uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 43, it tells us this. It says, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, if you are a major Bible nerd or like the former Bible Jeopardy champion of the world, if that is a thing, or you watched entirely too much Veggie Tales as a kid, uh, that town Joppa may sound familiar. Joppa was the place where um, the uh, prophet Jonah was called from in the Old Testament. If you don't know that story, prophet Jonah was in this town called Joppa. A prophet was supposed to be God's messenger, God's mouthpiece to the world. God gave him a message to take to Nineveh, but that was his enemy. And so he decided he wasn't going to do it. He ran the opposite direction instead of running to where God had called him. And all this happens. But, but to make the long story short, what happens is God interrupts Jonah's trip away from the people, brings him back, takes him to Nineveh. And whenever he gets to Nineveh, he sh- preaches this really short message. And like the entire city responds in repentance. They respond to his message. But Jonah's still not happy about it because he didn't want to see his enemies get a second chance from God. And you may be wondering, why on earth are we talking about Jonah? I thought we were in the book of Acts. Well, it's because chapter 10 opens up by introducing us to another enemy of God's people. Another person, and Peter is given this challenge in this passage to do something that would have been out of the norm for him. So if you look at Acts chapter 10, verse 1, it opens up by saying this. It says, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. So here, just going to make a couple notes really quick. First, uh, Caesarea was sort of like the, the Roman imperial headquarters for this area of the world. Rome was all over the world. Caesarea was their headquarters for the region in Judea. So we see that here. And then we also see that this guy Cornelius was a centurion. He was the leader of a unit of probably about 100 men. And they would have been part of the Roman occupying force in Israel. So the Israelites, well, they weren't very big fans of them. But here we see some other things that uh, we learn about Cornelius too. Let's jump to verse two. It says, he and all his family were were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Again, here we can note a couple of important things about Cornelius. First, he and his family are devout and what they called God-fearers. A God-fearer would have been someone who was not part of the Jewish people. It wasn't part of the Israelite nation. But whenever they saw this one God that the Israelites worshipped, they saw something attractive about that and decided to leave their worship of a bunch of different gods and worship this one God. 
So Cornelius was probably someone who had made that decision. He probably tried to follow the Ten Commandments as best he could. He gave to the poor like we see in this passage. He was a pretty good guy, but he hadn't made the decision to be circumcised or to follow the Jewish uh, dietary laws, which would have been essential for him to become part of the Jewish people. He hadn't made that decision yet, so he was what they called a God-fearer. Now, the Jewish people would kind of respect these people, but they would still keep them at arm's length because they were still unclean. They still hadn't come to fully embrace the teachings of Judaism. The second thing we see here is that Cornelius was a devout and God-fearing man, which resulted in him praying regularly and giving to the poor. In fact, it was during one of those regular times of prayer that that we think this next event happens, if you look at verse 3. It's an event that really doesn't just change Cornelius' life, but changes the trajectory of the church. It says this, it says, one time at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. Now, three in the afternoon would have been one of the set times of prayer in the Jewish nation. So it was during this time he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear, which if you look throughout scripture is almost always the response to an angel popping up on the scene. And he says, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Now here, I want to just note something important about Cornelius. Like we saw, he was a God-fearer. Today, we we may call him a seeker or religious or someone that considered himself spiritual, like like he trusted that there was a God out there bigger than him, and he was searching for truth. One key thing to look at whenever we look at Cornelius, that Cornelius wasn't just looking for a truth that he could fit into his life or fit into what he already believed. No. Cornelius was looking for a truth that he didn't need to necessarily fit into his life, but that he could actually build his life on. He was looking for something that really was true, really was worth committing his life to. And so whenever God reveals this vision to him and tells him to go and sin for this man, Simon, who's called Peter, who's at Simon the Tanner's house, all that stuff can get a little bit confusing, but he says, hey, go here and get this man named Peter. As soon as he heard that, he immediately got two of his servants and one of his best soldiers, and he sent them on a 31-mile hike from Caesarea down to Joppa to get this man named Peter to figure out what it is that God was telling him. Now, Peter is a guy who's pretty well known throughout, or throughout church history. He was one of Jesus' first 12 followers. And I, for one, am grateful for that because Peter has a track record of letting his humanity show a whole lot. And by that, I mean he messed up a ton. He's someone who I think a lot of us in here can probably identify with. And so just so maybe we can get our bearings with him, we're going to do a quick poll that's going to require your participation, okay? So first, if you have ever... Um, maybe said something, made a really bold statement only to discover that your foot was stuck in your mouth after you said it. If you ever stuck your foot in your mouth, could you raise your hand, please? Okay, apparently our new youth director had a minute there. Took him a minute. Okay, Jeremiah did raise his hand after a minute. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure we're all there. That's probably most hands. So we'll go on to the second one. If you've ever um, acted um, off of like an impulse only to not really think through the consequences of the action, if you've ever made an action without thinking about the consequences, would you raise your hand, please? Aaron Musgrave has never done that, guys. So if you would like to figure out what perfect sanctification looks like on earth, Aaron will be available after service to teach you his ways. No, I think we can all probably identify with this, right? We can all look at our lives and see moments where we did this. Well, this was Peter pretty consistently. I mean, there's a time in Matthew chapter 16, I think it is, whenever Peter makes this bold declaration, he says, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that God promised to send to us. He is the man. 
But then after Jesus goes on to teach for another minute or two about how he's going to die and all this stuff, Peter realizes that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. So he rebukes Jesus. It says he took him to the side and rebuked Jesus. Okay, that takes some confidence there. And um, just so you know, Peter was wrong. Okay, in case you didn't know how that story worked out. But he stuck his foot in his mouth there. There was the time whenever Jesus was washing his disciples' feet in John 13. And Peter's like, you're never gonna wash my feet. And then Jesus is like, yes, I am. And he's like, fine, then wash my whole body. And it's like, okay, Peter, come on now. But then, all right, after that, Peter confesses his undying devotion to Jesus. He says, I will never deny you. And then within 12 hours, what does Peter do? Well, he denies Jesus three times. See, Peter was a guy who was really confident, really bold, and yet found himself messing up a whole lot. Now, the cool thing with Peter is that we see a transformation happen in Peter's life whenever we get to the book of Acts. You see, Peter is reinstated by Jesus at the end of John chapter 20. And after that point, we see that that Peter is a leader in the early church, but then Acts 2 comes and God sends his Holy Spirit upon the church and Peter can't help himself but stand up and preach the good news about Jesus. He's out in public, and this guy who just a couple months before had denied even knowing Jesus was now telling the world that salvation was found in Jesus and Jesus alone. He's thrown in prison for his teaching, for his healing, all these different things that are going on. This Holy Spirit that had come upon Peter had changed everything for Peter. What I love about Peter is that Peter is a great case study in seeing how we need the Holy Spirit to continually transform us. It's not just like a one-time thing that the Spirit comes upon us and then we're set for life. Not all of us are like Aaron, okay? It's not that quick for most of us, right? No, most of us need this ongoing transformation where the Holy Spirit brings us in line with God's plan, with God's way. And so what's cool with Peter is that we see in Acts chapter 2, he preaches this message and 3,000 Jews respond and are baptized. Whenever we get to Acts chapter eight, we see that there are some some Samaritans who were kind of related to the Jews and and they received the gospel. So the uh, church in Jerusalem sent Peter and another disciple to go check it out. They figure out, hey, God is really moving here. They pray, the Holy Spirit comes upon those people. And we see that there's this movement of fulfilling what Jesus had told his disciples in Acts 1, 8 would happen. Acts chapter one, verse eight is a verse we've looked at several times. We're gonna look at it again. It says this, Acts chapter one, verse eight. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we saw in Acts two that the gospel spread there in Jerusalem. We see in chapter eight that it goes to that broader region there in in Samaria. And yet while Caesarea is still within the boundaries there of Judea, it will become a gateway city for the gospel going to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles, you see, were an entire group of people that the church had not targeted with the good news of the gospel. They saw that they weren't quite good enough for it. They thought you had to become Jewish before you could become a follower of Jesus. So this move to take the gospel to the Gentiles would require a transformation in Peter's heart and mind concerning who could be part of the church. See, there was this major division between Jews and Gentiles. And we're not really strangers to division in our own world, are we? I mean, if you look around our world, there's division around ethnicity. There is division around religion. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about this or not, but there's actually division in our world around politics. You guys know that? Crazy, right? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's a thing, okay? Just trust me. If you uh, want evidence, I'll give that to you later. Maybe I can come up with something, but but there's division all around in our world. And so for a minute, I I want you to think about in your own life, maybe who those people that would be like the Gentiles were to Peter. What is maybe a location that whenever you think about it, you think it should probably be erased? Is it a nation? Is there a city or a part of town that you think we would be better off without? Uh, maybe for you, it's, it's not one of those things. And maybe we need to just put flesh on this. Is it maybe not a location? Is it a person or a type of person? 
Whenever you think about this person or this type of person, it just brings up this, this anger within you that you don't really know where it comes from. It brings up this animosity. You think that you wouldn't maybe say this out loud, but this is the kind of person that the world would be better off without. Now I'm gonna list off just a few lightning rod words or places, um, not to really say anything about these places or these people or these groups of people, but just to maybe help us feel a little bit of what Peter felt whenever he thought about Gentiles. Maybe for you, that location in the world or group of people is Afghanistan right now or groups of people in Afghanistan. Whenever you think about that, it brings up this anger within you that wells up maybe without you even thinking about it. Maybe for you, it's people that are Republicans or maybe it's people that are Democrats. Maybe for you, it's people who voted for President Trump or voted for President Biden. Maybe for you, it's people from a certain part of town or people who are from a certain city. Maybe you are from Southern Illinois and you know it's Chicago, right? I remember whenever I went to stay in Effingham for a summer, I was like, oh, I'm going to Illinois. There's Chicago there, right? And I said that like my first day there and they're like, we don't like Chicago here, okay? I don't know what that might be for you, but I want you to think about who that might be. Is it people from the LGBTQ plus community or those people that make you feel that way? Is it people that are evangelical or maybe people who speak out against evangelicals? Who is it that maybe makes you feel this way? Is it it Muslims? Is it Kentucky fans like me? I don't know. Maybe it's, it's IU fans who continually bring up this last second shot that was hit and they seem to just forget that that was just paving the way for Kentucky to win a national championship. I don't know, okay? There are all kinds of people in our world or places or locations that bring up this feeling within us. And I know that might feel a little heavy to focus upon that for a minute, but I want you to think about why it is that you feel that way towards that group of people. Now I want you to think about what you would do if you were given the mission to go to that place or to that person or to that group of people to befriend them, to become friends with them and share the good news of Jesus with them. That is what happens here with Peter. He is given this mission to go and do this. You see, the animosity that existed between Jews and Gentiles was all encompassing. It was something that was religious, it was political, and it was ethnic, okay? It was all of these different things coming together in one and it couldn't be separated. And yet we see that God is working to break down these walls in Peter's heart and in Peter's mind. And I believe that God may want to break down these walls in his church's hearts and minds today. Maybe it's your heart where you've got this person and God is at work right now. But let's jump into verse nine and see how the Holy Spirit begins to transform Peter. Here's what we see starting in verse nine. It says, about noon the following day, so after Cornelius has this vision, uh, as they, these men that uh, Cornelius sends to Joppa were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now you may see this vision that he had and think, man, he had some really bad Taco Bell at midnight the night before, right? I mean, that is a vision that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. He sees in this vision all these different animals like pigs, deer, all these kind of things that, that the Jewish people weren't allowed to eat. And whenever he, uh, he gets that message to get up, go, kill, and eat, those of us in the room that are bacon lovers or hunters are saying, amen, right? What's wrong with Peter? Has he never smelled the goodness that is freshly cooked bacon in the morning? What is going on with Peter here? But Peter responds by saying, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And then God says this to him in verse 15. It says, the voice spoke to him a second time and said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
Now this happens three different times for Peter and Peter has a history of things with three. He denied Jesus three times. Whenever he was reinstated, Jesus asked him the question, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times Jesus reinstated him and said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs three times. So Peter in this moment knows God is saying something. He knows God is doing something, but he doesn't quite know what yet. He doesn't know what this is going to look like. He just knows that God is doing something in his life. And so whenever these men arrive at the gates, they begin calling out to Peter. And then we're told, I think it's verse 18, right? Uh, Or verse 19, sorry, that um, Peter was still thinking about this vision and the Holy Spirit speaks to him to confirm God is doing something. It says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Now, I don't know how the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter in this moment. I don't know if it was an audible voice, if it was an impression that he had. I don't know what it looked like, but I know that Peter recognized that God was changing him in real time, that God was speaking to him in real time, that God was shaping things and changing things for him. So Peter goes down and he introduces himself to these men. He says, hey, I'm the guy you all are looking for. Um, Now, why are you looking for me? And he goes on to, to, the men go on to tell him, well, we've got this guy named Cornelius. Cornelius had this vision. This angel told him to send for a man named Simon Peter, who was staying with Simon the Tanner. And you are Simon Peter and you are staying with Simon, or Simon the Tanner. So I'm here to talk to you. And Peter in this moment begins to see things open up for him. The spirit continues to transform his mind, to open up his heart, to see people the way that God sees him. And Peter does something that would have been completely unthinkable. At the end of, or at the beginning of verse 23, we see that Peter invites these men into the house to be his guests. He invited these men into the house, these Gentiles to come in to be his guests. This would have been unthinkable for Peter two hours before this, before this vision had taken place. But now God is working in him to change him. Now at the end of verse 23, we're told that Peter gets up the next morning and he goes with these men on this journey to go to uh, Caesarea, to Cornelius' house. Cornelius knows he's coming. And so Cornelius goes out, he gets all his relatives, all of his close friends and brings them into his house because he knows that God is coming with a message. That God is sending someone to speak to them. And he, he's been seeking after this truth, right? He's been looking for something. And now that God is coming through, he is ready. And here's what it tells us, starting in verse 27. It says, while talking with him, talking to Cornelius, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Now, let's just pause there for a second. If you look throughout the Old Testament, it's not like there's one law that says don't associate or eat with Jewish or with uh, Gentile people. But throughout history, as the Jewish people had tried to figure out how to remain clean, they had come up with this tradition. So this is the tradition or the law that Peter is talking about here. This is a break with our custom to visit with a Gentile. But he goes on to say, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you sent for me? Now, this is amazing with Peter here. At this point, Peter still doesn't know why he's there. The Holy Spirit has just said, okay, now you're going to go with these men. And Peter responded in obedience. Peter has just been taking this one step at a time. And God is still putting together in his heart and his mind what it is that God is trying to do. Now, when we get to this point, God has been speaking to Peter, right, for the last couple of days. He's been speaking to Cornelius, and he brings them together in this moment. And I think that what we can learn here is a few different things from Peter about what it looks like for us to love those that are different than us well. So really quick, I just want to take a minute to look at three ways that maybe we can learn from Peter here as the Holy Spirit was working in and through Peter about what it looks like for us to love our neighbors, especially those that are different than us well. The first thing is we can show no hesitation in befriending them. 
Have you ever noticed how natural it is for us to um, respond to people who are different than us, people that believe different than us, people that look different than us with hesitation? We, we aren't really sure how to enter into that relationship. We're not sure we want to enter into that relationship. Well, with Peter here, we see that as the Holy Spirit was moving in him and as he was obedient to that, it took away that hesitation. May we be a people that don't show hesitation, but actually engage with those around us in a meaningful way. Second, we can show hospitality towards everyone, opening our homes and our lives to them. We see Peter do that in verse 23 as he invites these men into the house. See, who we allow into our house, into our safe place, will say a lot about what we're willing to do in relationships to cross barriers, to cross things that have existed in our life. So think back to maybe that person or that group of people or the people from that location that you thought about earlier. What would it look like to actually welcome people from that group into your home, to engage with them, to befriend them, to build a relationship with them? And the third thing I think we can do is this. We can show humility before all people, regardless of their skin color and annual income, living with the understanding that we're all made in God's image. See, whenever we recognize that we're all made in God's image, that we are all image bearers of God, and that means we have an inherent dignity and worth that cannot be taken away from us. It means that we can't respond to others in pride. If you look at verses 25 and 26 there, you'll see that Peter had a great chance to respond in pride because Cornelius fell down to worship him. Peter could have responded in that moment to be like, man, it feels pretty good to be worshiped. I'll just hang out here for a minute. But he immediately calls this man to stand up and says, hey, I'm just a man like you are. We can respond in humility towards other people, recognizing that we are all image bearers of God. And we have the opportunity to invite people to become children of God. As Holy Spirit was uh, revealing this truth to Peter about how he saw others. And, and when we see other people as fellow image bearers, it transforms how we respond as well. So the Spirit brought about this transformation in Peter, and Peter immediately responds with what? With obedience. And so now we see him go, and he has this moment where he asks that question again. Why is it that you sent for me? Why is it that I'm here? And Peter or Cornelius kind of runs through the whole thing. He's like, well, I was in my house praying. All of a sudden there was a man in shining clothes who showed up and he told me that God had heard my prayers and remembered my offerings. And he told me to send for you, Peter. So I hope you have something good. <laughs> now, Cornelius says this in verse 33. And I love this statement. He says, so I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to tell us. You see, Cornelius recognizes that there's something special happening in this moment. This is something I love about how the Holy Spirit moves. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't confined to one location or one room at a time. The Holy Spirit can be at work all over the place. And we see that the Holy Spirit was at work in this house in uh, Caesarea with Cornelius just a few days before this. And that very next day, the Holy Spirit was at work with Peter, preparing him in Joppa. And now these things are coming together to change everything. Could it be that the Holy Spirit was actually in work or at work in you whenever you decided last night or maybe it was this morning and you looked up what time church started and you were like, nine o'clock, okay, it's 9.30, I guess we'll go to 11 o'clock. Could it be that the Holy Spirit was at work in you preparing you to come here to actually hear something from him and from his word? The Holy Spirit works, the Holy Spirit is moving in this story. And I love verse 34 and 35 as Peter begins to, begins to speak. He says, now I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Something is still true today. that He welcomes in those people, regardless of background, regardless of their history, into his family. It's something that God is at work doing and he has continually done. Now, Peter went on to share the good news with this group of people. He tells them the news about how Jesus had come, how he was Lord of all, how God worked powerfully through Jesus throughout his life, how Peter and these other guys were eyewitnesses to this happening. And Peter shares how Jesus was ultimately killed on a cross to pay the price for the sins of man. 
Now, three days later, he was raised from the dead and Jesus sent Peter and the rest of the disciples to testify to who God is and what God has done. And so he kind of culminates this message in verse 43, whenever he says, all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. I love that message. And I love that it was true 2000 years ago and that it's just as true today that anyone and everyone who responds and believes in Jesus can experience this forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. That offer still stands for you and for me. So Peter shares this and then God does what God does through the preaching of his gospel. I love verses 44 and following. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Some translations read in there, it says, even on Kentucky fans, but that's for another day. Um, For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. See, Peter quickly realizes here that God is doing something he never expected. God is bringing in these people that he considered his enemies. What did he say? Who are we to stand in the way? I want you to think again about that group of people you identified earlier. Could it be that, that you and I are standing in the way of them coming to meet Jesus and having a transforming relationship with him? Could it be that that we are standing in the way of that person or that group of people coming to know the goodness of Jesus because we haven't let the Holy Spirit transform our hearts and our minds to love our enemy, to love those we consider out of bounds? This is fulfillment, what we see here of, again, what was said in Acts 1.8, as the Gentiles are now being welcomed into the church. This opens up the door for the mission that Paul goes on for the rest of the book of Acts, as we see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. But as we look at this, I think it's important for us to recognize that as great as this moment is, not everybody was excited about it. I mean, let's just go to chapter 11, verse one. It says, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. That's good news, right? Well, what's verse two tell us? So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? Again, I want you to think about maybe that group of people in your life. What is it that people that are in your circle would say if you did start engaging them? Would they say, do you not know who they voted for? Do you not know what they believe? Do you not know the choices they've made in their past? And whenever those things happen, we have to ask the question, are we going to let the Holy Spirit continue to refine us, continue to change us? Or are we going to respond in the fear of man and actually let what those people are saying impact us more than the testimony of what God is doing in hearts and in lives? I love what it tells us in verse 17. But up to that point, what Peter does in response to this is he just kind of tells them what has happened. He says, hey, you know what happened? I I had this vision and it told me to go. And then whenever I went to this place, I shared this message and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And so he tells us in verse 17, he says, so if God gave them the same gift, the Holy Spirit, he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And there's only one appropriate response to this. And even these people who were hesitant with Peter's response before respond by saying this in verse 18. He says, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now that word repentance there is one that I think can kind of get a bad rap in our world today. 
Sometimes for some of us, I think it carries a little bit of baggage. Maybe it's someone that was yelling at you about something. But I want to take a minute just to think about that word repentance and what it means. First, repentance is a change of mind or a change of verdict. Okay, so sometimes if you look at some of the ancient law, like recordings that they would have there, they would record the the story of a verdict being handed down in a case, but then later new evidence was presented that changed the verdict. It caused the, the verdict to be repented, if that makes sense. And so for us, that means that we change our verdict, we change our mind about what it is that we place our hope in, about what it is that we place our trust in. Repentance is also a God-initiated gift. We see that that's what led to the praise of these people as they saw that God had given this gift to the Gentiles too. Repentance is the result of faith. You see, faith and action go together. They, They can't be separated. It's not like you respond and you choose to believe this thing and then your life just stays the same. No, these things go together. Repentance results in transformation. This is related to that point we just made. Repentance and action go together. A change of mind results in a change of life. It results in our lives being transformed as the spirit gets more and more of us. And finally, repentance is not a one-time decision. See, Cornelius and his family responded to the gospel. They changed their mind or they changed their verdict about how they were going to live their lives, what they were gonna build their lives on. And they said, we're gonna turn away from our sins. We're gonna turn away from the way we have been living. And we're gonna turn to God and trust him. We're gonna trust the new life that he is breathing into us. But I think if we look at the story of Peter in this passage, we see that Peter had a moment of of repentance too, right? Peter had to change his mind or change his verdict about who could be invited into the body of Christ. And whenever this happened, he shared this message about the rescue from sin that Jesus did for us. And it gave these people a chance to respond. Now, I don't know where you are in your life as you came into this room today. Are you like Peter? Maybe you've been around the church for a really long time. You've been through all the classes, you know all the stories. And yet, as we talk about these people that are hard to love in our world, you recognize that that there's still some work that the Holy Spirit has to do in you. Were there people that came to mind that you can't possibly imagine God welcoming in to his family? a group of people, a type of people, people from a certain location. I think the question for those of us that might fit into this category is what are we gonna do to respond in obedience this week? Will we be obedient when the Holy Spirit prompts us to go and engage with a relationship with someone who's different than us? Someone who looks different than us, who believes different than us, someone who lives different than us? Are you maybe like Cornelius? You came in this room because you've been on a spiritual journey for a while. You try different things, you're looking for something, but you don't quite know what it is. Could it be that God has brought you to this place to respond in faith, to experience this new life he's inviting you into? Because you maybe say with Peter's, or with Cornelius, as Cornelius said there in verse 33 or 34 there, whenever he said, here we are in the presence of God, just tell us what to do. Could it be that your next step is to make a profession of faith through baptism? Or maybe you came in this room and you weren't a believer, but you also wouldn't consider yourself spiritual or religious either. In fact, you came in perfectly content with not having God in your life. Well, last week we heard the story of a guy named Saul who had a mission to actually destroy the church until God came in and interrupted that and transformed his life. Would you be willing to have a conversation with someone about this this faith that maybe you say you hate or this faith that you think just doesn't work out? What might your step look like? 
Again, I don't know where you are today, but I think that God is calling each and every one of us in this room to respond to his word in faith and repentance, to take a step towards him, to respond by saying, okay, Lord, that's not what I thought before, but I'm saying yes to you. If you felt the spirit prompting you today and you've not made that decision to be baptized before, we would love for you to come have a conversation today. There are chairs set up in different spots in the room with someone there with a red lanyard. They'd love to have a conversation with you about what that looks like. It's not like walking to that chair automatically signs you up for this decision. No, but it puts you in a conversation with someone where you can figure out what it looks like. So if you felt the spirit moving in you, if you just felt a stirring or something that you haven't really felt before, go talk to someone about this decision. See what it might look like. See, Romans chapter six gives us this picture of baptism being this moment where the old self, where our sin is actually put to death and we are raised up in new life. It is a picture of what God is doing in our hearts. And if you wanna take that step, I hope you'll join us But right now. We're gonna go back into a time of worship. You can come forward anytime while we're singing. Right now we're gonna celebrate the life change we've already seen. We're gonna celebrate the baptisms we were able to celebrate earlier with Caitlin and with Mason. And we're gonna celebrate even others that are to come. So if you wanna make this choice, come forward. If not, let's stand and worship together.